With past viral outbreaks like SARS and COVID-19, lab safety is under scrutiny. Our next guest says that many research facilities aren't doing enough to address the risks, leaving the world vulnerable to another deadly outbreak. Joining us right now is Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's former FDA commissioner, also a CNBC contributor, and he serves on the boards of Pfizer and Illumina. And uh, Dr. Gottlieb, good to see you. It's been a while since we've gotten to talk. Um, lab safety, we know that this is a huge issue. You would think that what happened in COVID would bring much more scrutiny to this, but here we are in 2024. Where do those lab safety standards uh, exist at this point? Right. Four years later, we're really in no different of a position when it comes to the kinds of regulations that are imposed on high-risk research and what's required to be done in higher-complexity labs, labs with more precautions. You know, regardless of where you stand on the issue of whether or not COVID came out of a lab or didn't, I think there's certainly enough evidence at this point that points in that direction and should make us more than suspicious. And we should have taken actions to try to tighten high-risk research. We really haven't done that. The WHO has had two bites at this apple. They promulgated new regulations under their international health regulations um, that governs how countries report uh, epidemics and pandemic uh, strains. And that didn't include anything to really get better oversight over high-risk research. And then they separately crafted a pandemic treaty between nations, and that dealt mostly with uh, equity equitable distribution of vaccines and other resources between nations. It was another opportunity to try to build in greater measures, um, greater agreements around what countries would do to get better control over high-risk research, and it wasn't incorporated. We took some measures here unilaterally in the United States. There's going to be some regulations that go into effect in May of 2025 um, that governs so-called gain-of-function research, although it's defined differently and requires federally funded research that does, could give new features to deadly pathogens to undergo greater scrutiny if it's done at all. But that's not that hasn't been adopted internationally and we need to do that. There are there's such a long laundry list of items that we're upset with China over at this point, whether that be the way they treat American companies, um, you know, stealing their intellectual property. Um, worries about Taiwan, questions about support of, of Russia in their Ukrainian policies and, and their attacks on Ukraine. I mean, where does this fall on the laundry list? I, granted, a, a world, you know, a virus, some explosion taking off would be huge, but I guess when you look at risks of it happening versus not, where does this land and where should it land? Well, I think it's, it certainly should land higher, and we should be doing more to put pressure on the WHO to try to impose international agreements that require China to be doing more here. We really haven't done that. I mean, WHO is a paper tiger, more or less, and they weren't willing to stand up to China. We haven't done much to really confront them uh, on that. What I proposed in the Washington Post yesterday in an op-ed was that we just act unilaterally. We work with like-minded nations, maybe through the G7, and implement some kind of international accord, probably mirrored off of what we're doing here in the United States to get better governance over high-risk research, so-called gain-of-function research, those regulations that will go into effect next year. Maybe we internationalize that with other nations, uh, and we start there and then try to get more nations to join that pact. I think one thing we could do is to stipulate that institutions that aren't part of those agreements and perhaps researchers who don't work for institutions that are, are a part of those agreements can't get federal funding, can't get funding from the nations who join those agreements, certainly the United States. And maybe we start to prevent them from being able to display research, present research at international conferences and publish in international Western journals. I think we need to put in place some unilateral actions here that start to require rogue nations and nations that don't want to be compliant, but maybe with a nudge would be, to get in accord with some kind of international harmonization around best practices. Scott, ever since... You know, Watson and Crick, and, and, and then we, when we sequence the genome, this has been front and center for a lot of, of bioethicists. Uh, and it's just, it's really well known that this is a, a very, very dangerous um, element that, that we're facing, and it could be a rogue 
lab. It doesn't even have to be state-sponsored. It could be in China, and it could be state-sponsored. It could be accidental that, they get, that a pathogen gets released. You could be working on uh, weaponizing some type of pathogen, which I wouldn't put a pet, but it seems like Murphy's Law to me. It, it's such a powerful technology, and it's so scary and dangerous. It's almost like it's inevitable. I mean, I could almost, um, I could almost just say that, that if you were a pessimist, it's just a matter of time before, and it did happen already with COVID, and it, it could happen again with something much worse. Well, look, I think that there's going to be a stepped-up role for our national security agencies to get better surveillance of people who are doing nefarious things intentionally. But at the very least, what we could be doing is getting in place better controls to make sure that people who are well-intentioned, labs that are well-intentioned, nations that are well-intentioned and want to do the right thing, aren't the source of the next pandemic strain. And, you know, that would go a long way towards protecting us to the extent that there are nefarious individuals, labs, regimes that are experimenting with, the, with these things. And there certainly are. Um, we know that it's in the public domain. That's going to be harder to get control over. And to your point, the tools for doing this have gotten a lot simpler.